This is Gail Morgan thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. And thank you for joining us. With me today is my co-host Richard Fields and the friend of the show, John Cameron. Um, Richard, the Libertarian Party got together this weekend on an online convention to nominate their uh, presidential and vice presidential candidates. We now have George Jorgensen, a psychologist. I believe she's a psychologist, professor, and Spike Cohen. I'm actually not sure what Spike does. I haven't followed him very much. But I know right now he's a comedian. What's that? Right now he's a comedian, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've only come. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. He's a comedian. As serious as a comedian can be, he was uh, Vermin Supreme's uh, pick for VP, and how he got to be Joe Jorgensen's pick for VP, only the delegates can tell us. Oh well, that's, so that I means that, understand that one. That yes, means we're, that we're going to have uh, two comedians running as presidential nominees and one running as the vice presidential nominee. Well, yeah, yeah you can put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, one, and one serious candidate, Joe Jorgensen, MBA and and uh, scientist. You know, she is uh, eminently qualified. She ran a national campaign with uh, Harry Brown as VP back in I think it was 1996 or somewhere around there. And as far as I can tell, she is a very uh, good libertarian on policy. She doesn't uh, stray from the Libertarian Party platform in any way, shape, or form. She's also a pragmatic, so she's a you know an incrementalist. Not a uh, not the uh, the anarchist that uh, Spike Cl uh, Spike Cohen claims to be. Uh, so you know it'll be an, as as libertarian tickets go. It'll be I guess you could call it a balanced ticket. It, it'll ha it'll make the uh, the anarchist wing of the party happy as well as the uh, the pragmatic wing of the party happy. Uh, the only problem, of course, is not neither of them has national name recognition and uh, getting media attention when you don't already have a media name is nigh impossible as has been demonstrated by every other non ex republican presidential nominee that the that the lp has ever put forward yeah didn't have a question question about that uh, i looked at some of the numbers and and in the past uh the the people who aren't big names like uh, johnson did he have the record as far as uh, vote percentage yeah but he, he had the highest record from 2016 three uh, three something percent yeah. Uh, and he was a former governor of, of New Mexico, you know, yeah. big uh, Republican name, or as big a Republican name as we've ever had. And uh, um, the the other, and he also ran in 2012 uh, when he did fairly well. Mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, uh, Ron Paul ran in 1988. He didn't do all that well, in, in, interestingly enough, yeah. as a libertarian. Uh, but everybody, everybody else has run as a libertarian has been a good libertarian, but not somebody with a nationally recognized name. Yeah, that's the the problem libertarians fundamentally have is we can't break through that barrier without having somebody already on the other side of the barrier. It, yeah, really well, of course, of course, you're going to change that, James, because you're running for assembly and you're going to work your way. You're going to well, once you win that, you'll work your way up the ladder just the same way that uh, Democrats and Republicans have been doing for for eons. Right. Yeah. Well, well, let's hope not. I want to change the way politics is done. So oh, okay, good. <laughs> that's the whole plan with that. Mm -hmm. But, but actually, the, I want to go back to Spike Cohen for a second. I think the what the delegates did was actually a smart move. They solidified the base. It's you choose a vice presidential candidate who will keep that radical base happy. And so, from a delegate's perspective, that's actually a fairly smart move. You keep those that radical wing kind of happy. You give them keep them interested and happy and motivated to kind of participate. Well, you have the the lead candidate actually out talking to the general populace. Mm -hmm. So, from a strategy point of wise, it's not actually all that bad. I think I would have preferred Mons myself because it looks better to the public. You've got these two racist, sexist old white men, and you've got a woman and a black man running for it. So it's the contrast can't be any more clear. But you know, it's, this is a it's a party decision. It's a party thing. It's you know, I actually can understand why the delegates did what they did. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got with the Republicans, you've got a a populist nut job uh, as president, and then you've got a uh, 
uh, you know, an old line Christian conservative, uh, you know, ultra right wing as vice president. Same way with the Democrats, you've got a, you know, an old war horse as uh, the uh, presidential nominee, pre presumptive nominee. And it looks like it's going to be somebody like uh, Elizabeth Warren, who is a darling of the progressive left as the, uh, uh, the uh, vice presidential nominee. Well, hold on. I, uh, I, I think Spike Owen might, might uh, unless it's the wrong one. Is he a former baseball player? No, no. Spike Cohen. C O H E N. Cohen. Cohen. Yeah. Well, I know See, name that. recognition is everything. I, yes, Spike Owen was a great shortstop. Yes, I yeah. couldn't hit very well, but he was a great shortstop. <laughs> well, we need. You know, they're they're getting a lot of infield hits. Those Republicans and. Uh, uh, Mike Cohen. Yeah, we could use it for a couple double plays. You know, some of us on down ballot could use a few miracles in order to win. So, you know. Co Cohen spelled how? Um, I, I, let me help you with your uh, pre-show research, John. Yeah. It's C O H E N. <laughs> well, you know, I figured I'd. It is a big water media. And I'd I'd leave the you know the the chatter about uh, about this guy up to you, and you know I talk about stuff of substance. Oh, I see. Oh, so well, yes. John is our kind of the the legal beagle. So let's actually let's go ahead and and switch us over to uh, something that's maybe up your speed a little bit, John. No, you still practicing law without think, a license, John. Well, I th I think we should continue to talk about the libertarian candidates for a little bit longer because this is a libertarian show. And I I did I did glance at him, but I quite frankly know nothing about Spike. So why don't you? Fill me in on them because our viewers are probably curious too. Just take a couple of minutes and tell me why, you know, why uh, you made the point that it appeals to the radical base uh, of the libertarian non-party. Um, but uh, well, no, they're libertarian party. But I think uh, I, I kind of think that all the candidates, if if you're going to do anything. You know, even if they alienated, oh, how much? How many people are, are are members of the Libertarian Party in this country? No, so, actually, dues-paying member. I would have to look. It's not that many. Yeah. So I think if you alienate, you know, uh, what's what's realistic is to say that you know twenty, thirty percent of the population is philosophically libertarian. If you actually, oh, way, way more than that. Perfect. Way more than that. And I think that's the problem when you have you might have a libertarian candidate that appeals to the, the people in the party, but doesn't appeal to anybody outside the party. And if you don't get anybody outside the party, then you're not going to get a big percentage of the vote. So if you, I mean, I think we've all seen, I've certainly seen um, uh, polls taken where if you scrub the libertarian label off of them and ask people what, what um, they believe in or what they'd like to see as far as government and the country and everything else, something about 60% of the people should, could, could be labeled as libertarian-esque. And so, um, you know, the question is, how do you appeal to those? I mean, the, both of the, the uh, you know, people keep saying well, this is a two-party country. I, I read the Constitution again the other day, and nowhere in it does it say there's there's two parties. Uh, and they're exactly the same, except they make noise about being different, but 99% of what they do is the same. They're, they're either fascists on the left or fascists on the right, and they spend more money than they bring in, and, and they keep electing themselves over and over again, and the deep state people are untouchable. So... You know that's what people are upset about. You got you've got to have a candidate that can talk about how to change that. But anyway, I've gone over my time on the candidate. So, uh, but what's what spikes? Just out of curiosity, you, you told me what Joe Jorgensen has going for. Um, well, Spike is a a successful software uh, 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 company owner who uh, decided that he would take a different direction in his life, and he started something called Muddy Waters Media, which is a uh, essentially uh, uh, a fun kind of website that makes uh, Anakin's kind of uh, uh, political commentary. And I think the money comment for Spike is I, I'm, I'm an, you know, I'm an anarchist, but I fully well understand the reason for the uh, pragmatic wing of the uh, party to uh, move in an incremental uh, fashion. I'm paraphrasing, but something along those lines. Okay. Right. Cool. cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, my problem with the anarchist wing of the party, 
is that the anarchist wing of the party can't even get a majority support in the libertarian party and yet they think if we go push their message out into the general public that it's somehow going to resonate and it doesn't even resonate fully in the libertarian party i think they need to be a bit more realistic no, no. true Yes, that's kind of my. I mean, the, the word the word is it puts people off mainly because the word anarchy or anarchist has been associated with the anarchists of the left who are anything but anarchists. They're, you know, they're they're big government progressives for the most part. So that's that's the problem. It's, it's, it's a word that has a whole lot of negative connotations. Well, and they libertarians. Speak speaking of words, libertarians are really liberals until the progressives and the socialists stole the word from us. We're classical liberals. Well, and that's why I, you know, I go to Europe a couple times a year. I think I'll continue to do so, and and that's our. Uh, and I don't want to call them progressive because you know basically it's the star chamber. The people that self-labeled liberals here get a free ride because people in uh, the the media is so biased that people in in Europe assume that that our party that self-labels conservative which and some of them are actually classic liberals are fascists and they assume that the the uh, the, the real fascists which are the so-called liberals are actually um uh classic liberals so it's very very confusing because if you go to england and look at their liberal party or italy and their liberal party or germany and their liberal party in france basically they would vote maybe libertarian in our country so you know if you control the the message and the platform uh, you know i tried to find on google today um a copy of the uh the uh regulatory bill of rights and the only place i could find it was in a uh, a story not the forbes story that was the closest i could find but a link inside the forbes story which found it and i put in search terms for it that said text of the regulatory bill of rights on google and it took me nowhere near it so you can't tell me that that the that the the media bias isn't having a huge effect on the information people can can get at their fingertips to to make rational decisions and actually yeah, the, I mean, yeah so well yeah, and actually that's a, that's a smooth transfer to the regulatory bill of rights uh, i found the same link that you did and the regulatory bill of rights uh, has uh, provisions that uh, essentially no one would ever disagree with, but it will be attacked uh, basically as a character assassination uh, uh, attempt against uh, against Trump simply because Trump proposed it. It has things like you know proving uh, the violation is the job of the government, and not proving innocence on the part of the accused. Due process. That's you know, real, real basic and real simple. It talks about uh, you know the administrative uh, administrative state being prompt and being fair, something that's far from the case uh, mm -hmm. in the most re in, in recent history. It talks about adjudicators being independent of enforcers. In other words, the sheriff can't be the judge, and that's entirely different from the situation that we have in administrative agencies right now. It talks about the. Uh, duty of the uh, accusers to uh, you know the agency to share favorable information on the accused that's mm -hmm. a very very important part of the rule of law and criminal law in administrative law not so much it should be it talks about clear rules who can argue with clear rules it talks about proportionate penalties uh, we have, you know, John, you can talk about some of the things that we saw at Pacific Legal Foundation where the penalty was ex outrageously uh, Unrelated to the to the alleged defense, uh, co no coercion, you know, no no blackmail. You follow this uh, this uh, law, or will you know come after you in other ways? Uh, the agency has to be accountable. Right now, if you want to sue uh, a, a federal administrator because they're malpracticing, good luck with that. They have in, they have uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, no more no more surprises. Who can argue yeah. with uh, no no knock raids in the middle of the night over a uh, uh, you know a environmental uh, over over a hawk maybe yeah. So yeah. it's uh, that I I like what's spelled out. It's very general language, and basically it's just uh, stating that um, that people in the I just call them the deep state, the administrative state, the regulatory state, 
need to follow the same rule of law that any prosecutor would have to follow in criminal court. And, and that should show people how huge this problem is if they're suddenly now being made aware that, that these administrative law judges, I mean, there are many, many cases where one person is judge, jury, and executioner and can, uh, is making the rule, enforcing the rule, and setting the fine in these administrative agencies. And, and, and even though the letter of law says you're not supposed to do that, they get away with it all the time. And, and you, talk, you talk about uh, uh, penalties that are outrageous uh, and coercion. There was a guy sent for sent to prison and uh, came back out of prison, an 80-year-old Navy vet, and then died of a stroke for digging some ponds to fight fires with. And the only reason he had anybody uh, uh, in the, the – the only reason he had the prosecution, such as it was, had any information about what the guy was doing is they threatened to throw the woman who – was witness against him into prison for doing the same thing if she didn't become a witness for the government. So, I mean, this kind of stuff in these administrative cases, it's just nobody, nobody would believe it if you told them it happened. And if it happened in a criminal court and the, the uh, person was a person of color or a member of a minority group, the ACLU and everybody else would be, you know, lined up behind them to defend them. So it's, it's great that that these general terms are spelled out there there's going to be some problems with it though because uh you know it talks about cutting you know cutting corners and and uh you know just an example of regulatory abuse in this country um in oakland um uh, kaiser uh wasn't happy during this the covid panic pandemic that's going on now Kaiser wasn't happy with the lab results so we could get back on COVID-19. They said, we need our own lab. And in their headquarters in Oakland, they said, well, let's, let's go ahead and build one in Oakland here. And, and normally it would have taken them the permit process and the inspection process and everything else because of the way things are done. It would have taken them over a year to get this lab built. They built it in a week because the, the Oakland lined up to have same people, same rules, same regulations done. They didn't, they didn't ignore any safety rules. They didn't do anything. They just had the people expedite every single thing that would normally take a year. And they built the thing start to finish in a week, maybe two weeks, but I think a week for all the regulatory process. So, why does it take some guy who wants to employ a hundred people somewhere and create some wealth in this country, you know, a year to get permission to do stuff. And it's this huge regulatory burden we have. And it's a wonderful idea that, that um, the president's saying, reduce it, get out of the way and all the rest of that. On the other hand, the same kind of quick action is going to be used by some governor. Did you read the Forbes article, Richard, as yeah. well as the other one? Yeah. So the problem that they pointed out, is some governor, and I think his name will probably be Newsom, who uh, declares a state of emergency because of global warming and then decides to uh, enforce whatever rules and regulations he wants because of that. And instead of having advice and consent and all the rest of this stuff that, that we're looking at to, to get out of the way to reduce regulation, he just goes right to throwing people in jail for driving a car. I mean, so... There's two sides to this coin. I like the idea of what it spells out, but we've seen in the past that the fascists uh, wearing the, the, the suit of clothes of the, the label of liberal can twist just about anything and make it an obscenity. Yeah, you know, there's an interesting wrinkle to this whole thing. Well, first of all, the, the downside of the regulatory bill of rights is as soon as there's a different administration, it will be vetoed, it will be reversed immediately. Another downside is that we're asking administrative uh, law, uh, administrative law people, uh, who are entrenched bureaucrats, to do everything that is in their that is not in their bureaucratic self-interest. Yeah. Good luck with that. And but the, but the interesting, but the positive note is this: uh, a Rasmussen poll so, shows that 42 percent of the public is uh, is uh, willing to uh, be uh, tough on enforcing all of this coronavirus shutdown law. Uh, would be willing to throw scoff laws, uh, small business scoff laws into jail or confiscate their licenses, that sort of thing. 
that, that, that indicates that a majority of the people is either undecided or against all of this the coronavirus yeah. lockdown. I think so there's we're yeah. seeing a we're seeing a, a very substantial number of people at the grassroots saying this this is nonsense. We need to stand up against it. And the the nature of tyranny, and that's what we have. Uh, you know, petty tyranny. The nature of it is that well, it's it only not petty at all. There's 32, 000, 32 million people unemployed because of this tyranny right now. So it's not petty at all. Pardon my adjective. The uh, the nature of tyranny, period, is that it will not stand if a majority or a substantial majority of the people say, go to hell. It won't stand even if a substantial minority say, go to hell. Because you start you know, you start putting business owners in jail for hiring people or feeding people or clothing people or or trying to drive a truck through full of medical supplies to some place. Yeah, the, uh, the enforcements have been just absolutely insane. Telling restaurants that they can't sell food, uh, you know, from from the from you know from the, using the restaurant as a storefront. That's that's nuts. Mm. It's letting food go to waste. People see that, see no reason for it. They follow, you know, restaurants obviously follow the same health and safety regulations that grocery stores do. And there's some petty rule on the books that is going to be enforced now during a so-called uh, pandemic that says a restaurant can't sell food, uh, you know, unless they cook it first. That's it's just nuts. Mm. Well, what's what? Uh, and that brings me to uh, to another example. And then we probably need to go into another topic, beat this thing to get to death. In California, if you wanted to get uh, booze, Go to your local bar and, and grab a drink and take it and walk down the street drinking it or take it and put it in your car. Uh, the answer would have been no. But all of a sudden, when the they masses needed to be, what's the word, drugged, I guess, uh, to put up with sedated. all this. Stuff. Let's just say sedated. Sedated. Sedated, yeah. Because uh, I don't know if alcohol is typically classed as a drug. Um, well, you can, you can go on your app on your phone right now and get your Moscow Mule delivered. So, uh, you know, anybody who can't walk to their cabinet and make one, I'm kind of worried they're already too drunk to keep drinking. But, um, you know, so all of these absolutely necessary rules, something like five, 500 regulations that they're aware of, the, the people that wrote one article said, have been thrown out the window already. Um, it, I think we've, we've all seen studies that say something like uh, – uh, 90% of the regulations that are out there, or maybe even more, are not necessary for the health and safety of the American people. They're basically just um, they're, they're job-producing machines for bureaucrats. And, well, they're, uh, and, they're, and they're responsible. They're, they're necessary for the health and safety of the regulated businesses oh, uh, against yeah. competition. Well, then that's like, you know, did the contractor state license board here in California you know, every time you bring that up, they you can't do a job without a license over four hundred or six hundred dollars. A contractor won't touch a job under three thousand dollars because it's not even worth pulling a permit. So you turn a bunch of little old ladies who hire a handyman to fix something in their house into criminals, and that same handyman into a criminal. And basically, it's just to prevent competition with the licensed contractor. And we could go on and on and on and on, but this the regulatory bill of rights is way overdue. And let's go into the next subject before people. You know, their head slam on the on the table from falling asleep. Well, actually, that's actually a good head slamming on the table is a good segue to the next uh, subject. We've got um, there's a report out of San Francisco last week that they've had a year's worth of suicide attempts in four weeks. Mm -hmm. And all these people have lost jobs. You know, it's not just a job when someone loses their job. It's their support system. It's their friend network, you know, and communities get ripped apart. And I think as we're starting to see this, as we've got, what, 30 million unemployed, the side effects, the psychological side effects of that are actually starting to play, which actually goes back to, you know, having a psychologist as president. You know, we may very well need a psychologist as president to get us through this next bit of trauma. We're going to have a cultural PTSD well, as we get through this. And it might be actually a good thing to have someone who can kind of walk us through and help us kind of as a society work through the trauma we've all experienced, whether it's the mass deaths or the mass unemployment and the mass economic difficulties, the social isolation it may actually be a kind of a perspective that we hadn't actually thought of that i hadn't thought of until actually just now yeah and then the other subject we're going to try to touch on uh, a little bit of cbd uh to help fight off uh fight off the COVID 19 if we get to it i absolutely agree 
Uh, males especially, especially older males, take much of their self-esteem and self-worth from from what they do for a living. And speak, and speak for yourself, John. What? Well, I I'm unemployed, so I I have no self-esteem. What the hell? <laughs> Everybody should know that. Um, look at this face. Is that no, um, no. So people, as you said, James. They get, they get much of their worth from, from being productive individuals. And when all of a sudden they are unproductive through no fault of their own, they do a great job in their, their job, they work hard, they give great value to people, all of a sudden that job is gone because some bureaucrat somewhere decided that the best possible way to fight uh, a, a, a virus uh, that we're still completely uncertain of, how, how many people are being killed by it and how many people have it is to shut down the world. And so um, you're feeling powerless. You don't have your, you don't have your support network. As you said, uh, you don't have money coming in, which a lot of people base their self-worth on money. Uh, you don't have the interaction of friends. I mean, you don't have all the stuff we're doing. So maybe that's, that should be Joe's pitch for, for, uh, for president. I'm I'm going to make this country well again. Well, yeah, and, and the, uh, the the other interesting thing is there won't be any. There probably, who knows what will happen? But there's a good chance there won't be any massive Trump rallies, and I don't think any Biden massive rallies were ever in the in the works anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know the uh, the door to door aspect of campaigning, you know the, mm -hmm. the boots on the ground, the uh, uh, the ground game, that's kind of out the window for oh, I don't, the I don't foreseeable, have fu foreseeable future. A lot of campaigning is going to migrate to the web. Now, the problem, of course, is you've got Facebook, Twitter, and uh, YouTube and the rest pretty well censoring anything that goes through their portals. So mm -hmm. the question is whether or not libertarians will be able to develop their own uh, independent portals to uh, get the word out. If they're able to do that, uh, then there's a fairly good chance that uh, a libertarian candidate, even one with no name, uh, like Jorkinson, can break through to the other side and uh, uh, actually have an impact on the race and even win. Mm. Now, as long as they don't search for on Google. Yeah, as yeah, long as they have, 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 We have to have, we have to look at alternatives to Google, Facebook, Twitter, and, and YouTube, because that's, that's being effectively censored. Can, can I do anything that's not? That's can, not I do unpaid, can I do an unpaid pitch for a commercial enterprise? You, you got about thirty seconds, John. Duck, duck, go. Duck, duck, go. Duck, yeah. duck. Completely unfiltered, untraceable search results. Duck, duck, go. So yeah, I don't and, use Google and, myself. And the results are just as good. Yeah, I don't use Google myself. I use Bing or go, duck, duck, go or whatever other thing I kind of at the moment. I avoid Google like the plague. Except for YouTube, it's essentially the only thing of Google I use. It's owned by Google. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. It's a so it's a Google thing, but until Bitshoot becomes its own big thing, it's kind of what we have to use. Mm -hmm. And that is about the time we have. Well, so I'd like to thank John and Richard for showing up and ha having this conversation with us today. For more information about the topics, I'll get them up on libertariancounterpoint.com. If you happen to be watching us on YouTube, please hit all the buttons. We greatly appreciate it. And from all of us here at Libertarian Counterpoint, we'd like to thank you for watching. And please remember to love everybody. More than thanking you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint each Thursday at 8 p.m. Channel 17 on Comcast, on YouTube, and on Facebook. We invite you to come again next week.